The recession of 58 more or less kick-started the general American buying public's interest in smaller and more fuel-efficient cars after years of being brainwashed that bigger is always better and the success in your life is measured by the size of your automobile. Cars were wide and low, and their fins were tall and proud. He who blinded the most fellow drivers with all his shiny chrome on the highway was the winner. But in fact, it was a long time coming. Because if it wasn't for the recession, then it was a growing number of foreign imports like the Volkswagen Beetle that started to catch on in the US. Some people were looking for a second car, or were forced to drive something more fuel efficient. The big three, so Ford, General Motors and the Chrysler Corporation, set up programs to develop a smaller model, and released their efforts by the start of the 1960s. And now I hear you think, Edward, have you become so desperate and running out of ideas that you are essentially recycling one of your earliest episodes? Maybe. But we are going a bit deeper in the quirky compact cars made by General Motors, and only focus on these cars. Welcome everyone to episode 55 of the Automotive History series, where we are going to take a closer look on General Motors' effort of creating compact cars in the early 1960s, and succeeding in doing so. Over at GM, the idea of making a compact car went as far back as 1956. The whole program was led by Ed Cole, an engineer at heart who became a general manager at the Chevrolet division of GM. Now, with the many ideas Cole had about advanced engineering, he saw the creation of these new compact cars as a great opportunity to test them out. Compact car in the first place, but a test bed for advanced engineering with a focus on fuel economy as a second. Management decided to launch two new platforms for the upcoming compact cars, the Z platform for the Chevrolet division and the Y platform for the so-called BOP divisions, Buick, Oldsmobile, Pontiac. GM's prestige luxury brand Cadillac was naturally left out of the picture, because who needs a baby Cadillac anyway, right? Let's not forget. Instead, Buick was pushed forward as a baby Cadillac alternative. Their upcoming compact would be the most luxurious of the bunch. By the late 1950s, the development was finished and GM was ready to release four compact-sized models. These cars are... A new Chevrolet Corvair. New Pontiac Tempest. Get a load of my Oldsmobile F85. Where do I park my new Buick Special? And GM wasn't the only one, as Ford released the Ford Falcon and its sister, the Mercury Comet. And the Chrysler Corporation... Well, let's not talk about what the hell Chrysler was doing around that time. These cars were the American take on the compact car theme, trying to bridge the gap between European fuel efficiency and size and American luxury and style the buying public got accustomed to. In fact, many buyers wanted to go smaller, but were still a bit suspicious of these European compact cars that looked too small, cramped, feeble, and came with wheezing four-cylinder engines and without automatic transmissions or air conditioning. As a result, these cars were compact by American standards. To put it in perspective, the Corvair was 4 meters and 70 centimeters in length. This is about the same size as a current day Volkswagen Passat or a Honda Civic. So not exactly the smallest, especially if you compare it to what they tried to compete with, the Volkswagen Beetle, which was only around 4 meters in length. And most European cars only came with 4 cylinders, the GM cars came with larger 6 or 8 cylinder engines. But let's take a look at these wonderful and technologically advanced compact cars, one division at a time. The Chevrolet Corvair is arguably the most well-known of the bunch. It was Ed Cole's engineering passion project, and on top of that, had to compete with the growing numbers of foreign imports, mostly the German Volkswagen Beetle. GM tried to figure out what made the Beetle so attractive in the first place. Was it its low retail price, its simplicity, uh, its fuel efficiency, or its terrific reliability? Nah, it must have been the flat four boxer engine mounted in the rear. There's a sales pitch. And so GM developed what is essentially an Americanized Beetle. The Corvair had its engine mounted in the rear, when front engine was the norm. It also had a six-cylinder boxer engine. Very unusual for American standards. Uh, they, they only knew their cylinders in an upright position, and preferably in a straight line or a V layout. And the car featured European styling. No fins, no bubble tops, and no big aggressive bumpers. In fact, I like to go so far to say that this is one of the very few American cars that look the most European. Ever. It's an easy-on-the-eye design, it looks kinda like a flying saucer, but in a good way. 
The only giveaway are the round tail lights, but even some European cars had them at the time. And yet, not many people know this, but the Corvair in and on itself influenced a lot of 60s European cars. The German NSU Prince looks like a Corvair. The British Hellman Imp looks like a Corvair. As a car maker, I don't think you couldn't get a greater compliment when you try to design a car like the competition, only for the competition to design their cars like yours. What the Corvair tried to chase, it actually became the creator. Nice. Now, Volkswagen came into model series, the regular Beetle passenger car and the transporter van, which was also marketed as a family-friendly station wagon in the US. Well, anyway, as GM had this model range also covered by offering the Corvair in many body styles, as well as offering a cap-forward designed van, and that was a first. The Greenbrier came as a van and pickup, and the pickup was dubbed the ramp side truck because it could also open from the side. Moving up GM's prize ladder, we arrive at Pontiac. Whereas the Chevy was quite different than the rest of the lineup, the Tempest and other senior compacts, whatever that means, features a more American styling and rode on a separate platform, the Y platform. However, for the longest time this was not the case. Upper management initially wanted to cut the development cost of the Corvair by spreading the rear engine design across the other divisions. Pontiac would get a rebadged Corvair named the Polaris, and Olds and Buick were also on that list. But there were two guys within Pontiac, Bunky Knudsen and John DeLorean, that just started out to convert Pontiac from a grandpa brand into an exciting white track performance brand appealing to the youth. And a rebadged watered-down Corvair with a weird six-cylinder would never meet that image. They were having none of this and proposed an alternative drivetrain. The Corvair body couldn't even hold a V8 engine, so the slightly larger Pontiac Compact model had enough room to fit a V8 in the front of the car, making it part of Pontiac's performance image. But not only V8s were offered, because guess what? Also a four-cylinder was offered. A four-cylinder. Considered elsewhere in the world as the golden standard of engines, in the USA the engine was completely dropped. You either had the optional eight-cylinder V8 or the base level six-cylinder straight six. For the majority of American cars, four cylinders were dropped by the late 1930s. So in what way would a four cylinder help Pontiac's performance image? Honestly, I don't really have an answer on that, but Pontiac tried everything to make its so-called Trophy 4 an attractive economical option and exciting performance option at the same time. See, the Trophy 4 was nothing more than a regular V8 cut in half. <laughs> it's just as simple as that. Gotta love American engineering. Pontiac took the 389 or 6.4 liter engine, a V8, and simply took one cylinder bank, so four cylinders, and turned it into a 194 cubic inch slant 4. And guess what? As luck would have it, 194 or 3.2 liters is exactly the half of 389. The engine was called the slant 4 because the cylinders were at an angle because of the original V layout. But if you check the right boxes, the engine could make 166 horsepower, which was very respectable for a 4-banger at the time, especially compared to the larger 6- and 8-cylinder engines. So in some way, the performance aspect was covered. But wait, there's more! Because not only the engine was unique, so was the entire drivetrain layout. Okay, get this. Usually an American car is pretty straightforward. Engine in the front, power to the rear. And there is a transmission and a drive shaft in the middle. Now, the Tempest also had an engine in the front and power to the rear, but shifted its transmission also to the rear through a so-called transaxle. The transaxle was connected to the engine by a smaller torque shaft, allowing for an almost flat floor and an almost perfect 50-50 weight distribution. It was nicknamed Rope Drive, although that's a bit of a misnomer because it was not an actual rope. The setup was quite rare for an American car, but not too uncommon for European sports cars at the time, like the Lancias and the Ferraris. And the Tempest was a quite good driving car. So, despite a fiery four-cylinder, the whole sporty image was saved. 
Oldsmobile would also initially receive a rebadged Corvair, internally known as the Old 66, but the chief of the division agreed with the gentleman over at Pontiac and supported the Tempest affair, and so Oldsmobile would also make their own senior compact car, based on the white platform and sharing the basic body with Pontiac, but featuring its own design. Around this time, Olds presented itself as the experimental division within GM, the company that brings you advanced technology today. And they did. The car in and on itself wasn't particularly special. It featured up-to-date, slightly space-age styling, and there was no rear engine or rope drive or whatever to be found. Only one engine option was available, a 215 cubic inch or 3.5 liter Rocket V8. However, the V8 was not made of good old heavy cast iron, but its lightweight and awesome and new material called aluminium. See, there is an I in there. Get used to it. The aluminium V8 was originally designed by Buick, but shared with other divisions like Oldsmobile. But the fun doesn't stop there. A year after the F85's introduction, a new engine was added to the list. It was still the Rocket V8, but now with turbocharging technology. The revolutionary new Turbo Rocket V8 engine. That's right, when it comes to turbocharging, many people say that it's mostly a European or Asian affair starting in the 1980s, but nope. The Americans were the first, starting with the 1961 Oldsmobile and closely followed by a sporty version of the Corvair. The engine was called the Turbo Rocket and the model was known as the Jetfire. And I can't say that name enough, Jetfire. It just, oh, America's a car name. I, I love a Jetfire. What do you drive these days? I drive an Oldsmobile Jetfire with a Turbo Rocket V8. <sighs> In a day and age the name Turbo was applied to everything, Turbomatic, Turbodrive, Turbo Turbo, the Turbo Rocket was the only engine that could claim the rights of that name. In fact, the engine was turbo and supercharged, and the extra power that came from these additions was enough to rival engine blocks twice the size. It also came with a disadvantage. The engine was prone to knocking. Now, today, we have engine management systems that take care of the knocking. But back in the day, the cars came with a separate tank, what Olds called the Turbo Rocket Fluid. Oh, here we go again. Turbo Rocket Fluid. It was a mixture of distilled water, methanol, and corrosion inhibitor. And it was up to the owner to regularly check the tank and refill it. But you know that the average driver didn't want to take care about any of this stuff and started to complain as soon as the turbocharging engine started to show problems because of the neglected maintenance. Not many jet fires were sold and even if they were, owners started to complain that the cars didn't work as intended. Surprise, surprise, who would have thought? And brought them back to the dealers. After a couple years, GM offered a program where they could take back the cars and they'd remove the turbo for free. The last car to use the white platform was Buick. As mentioned before, Cadillac was left out of the picture. So if Pontiac was all about sportiness and all about advanced engineering, the Buick Senior Compact could be positioned as a luxurious small car, the closest thing to a small Cadillac. And they did. Buick released two versions of the same model, the Buick Special and later on the Special Skylark. The Skylark trim option offered the whole shebang. Chrome accents, Skylark emblems, all vinyl interior and optional bucket seats, turning the car into a small, gentleman sporty cruiser. In fact, I know someone that owns one of these and I am thinking of doing a little review on it. So far, so good. But what is so radical about this one? Once again, we have to look under the hood. It should be mentioned that Buick originated the use of aluminium in their V8 engines and shared it with Oldsmobile, but wait, there is more. Besides the 215 cubic inch V8, Buick also offered a slightly smaller engine, a V6. And the V6 was once again a V8 where the last two cylinders were simply chopped off. The engine was dubbed the Fireball V6, but was made of regular cast iron and not aluminium like its 8-cylinder brother. According to journalists, the V6 performed just as good as a regular V8. But the choice to make this engine in the first place remains a bit of a mystery. So, 
To wrap it up, we have a European styled car with a six cylinder boxer engine mounted in the rear. We have a light sports car with an uncommon four cylinder and a unique drivetrain setup. An advanced car with an aluminium engine and the first to have turbocharging technology. And an air luxury compact car with a V6. Surely this is a success, right? Well, it was in the engineering department, but the sales department um, had a different opinion. The Corvair sold the best and the BOP senior compact cars sold moderate, uh, but not spectacularly. I think it's safe to say that they did not meet GM's expectations that they would practically sell themselves because compact cars were all the rage at the moment. Maybe they were too unconventional for the taste of the average car buyer. The influence of these compact cars was short-lived. All the cars, except the Corvair, were on sale for three years and when the customary redesign was up, management decided to make the cars bigger in the process and passed them on as intermediate or mid-sized cars. Ford already showed that this vehicle class was more popular with the Fairlane model. And as much as the cars looked like just a footnote in GM's history, their legacy was a lot bigger but in different ways. I am not even going to touch on the Corvair story, but to keep it short, some road tests were executed and under certain circumstances, the car, because of its drivetrain layout, could lead to dangerous driving dynamics and crashes in emergency situations. This came to light along with the criticism of a man called Ralph Nader and his book Unsafe at Any Speed. Most people say Nader criticized the Corvair, but he actually used the car as an example to criticize the entire American auto industry, demonstrating that upper management knew about the unsafe aspects of the cars, but did nothing to improve it, and used the Corvair as an example. Later tests found out that the Corvair wasn't all that more dangerous than, let's say, a Volkswagen Beetle, which suffered from the same problems. But hey, the damage was already done, and sales plummeted throughout the 60s. Pontiac retained its performance image, and when the Tempest was converted to become a mid-size model, it eventually received a GTO performance package. The package then became a standalone model, and the Pontiac GTO laid the foundations of what eventually became the muscle car, shoving your largest and powerful engine in a mid-size model. Oldsmobile had a similar story. The Jetfire with its turbo was great and all, but quickly dropped and was a classic case of the right tech at the wrong time. But the F85 eventually evolved into the mid-size Cutlass, and the Cutlass eventually became almost like a sub-label within Oldsmobile, with many different versions and body styles in the 60s and the 70s, reaching peak popularity in the late 70s and the 80s. The Buick Special also evolved to become an intermediate model, much like Pontiac and Olds. This time there is not a whole lot to talk about, other than the engine. The aluminium V8 was in principle a great lightweight engine, but also suffered from some minor problems, and management decided to switch back to regular cast iron blocks. But out of nowhere, British car maker Rover showed great interest in the lightweight V8, and wanted to take over the tooling. Jim thought, oh how convenient, accepted their request and the engine was given a second life in the UK as the Rover V8. Rover made many revisions and other versions of this engine and sold some of them to other smaller British car makers in need of an engine. The company stuck to it as late as the new millennium, the last car to feature the Rover V8, which is essentially a Buick V8 from the 60s, was the early 2000s Land Rover Discovery. From today's perspective, the awesome early 60s compact cars from GM are not the most well-known cars. Only the Corvair you'll likely find at some classic car show. They were affordable, budget cars to begin with, and meant to be used for a while and then be thrown away. And let's face it, a top-spec Impala, 88 or Wildcat speaks more to the imagination than, let's say, a Special. Now, what moved the company to go so all out on experimenting with advanced engineering and technology on a car in an uncertain market segment while usually keeping a tight fist on its wallet remains a mystery. But that's another reason to cherish these interesting cars. As it turns out, GM can make awesome compact cars.